It's my privilege to introduce our speaker this morning. Royce Abel has uh, been attending Southside for several years, and um, he is a godly man who loves the Lord, who loves his word. And this has been a year of many firsts for Royce. He graduated from the graduate program at School of Mines. He got married. He started his new job as an engineer. And today, to finish out 23, he began his preaching career here at Southside. Um, <laughs> I was blessed a couple of years ago for Royce to be the intern in the youth ministry. And I was so encouraged by just working closely with him. Um, specifically in this realm, Royce is very meticulous about his walk with the Lord. He's meticulous in the text. And I was able to um, sit under his teaching for a summer as he ministered to the youth. And so I think we're going to be blessed this morning. And so Royce, um, the pulpit is yours. Preach to us. Good morning. There we go. Thank you, Brian. Um, I just want to extend another welcome to Southside Bible Church this morning, um, especially on this Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, welcome to those who are here regularly, and a special welcome to those who are guests. Um, as, as Brian said, my name is Royce Abel, uh, and it's a great honor to open the Word of God with you this morning. Well, I hope that everyone had a blessed Thanksgiving holiday that bellies were filled with delicious food, that gatherings were filled with fellowship and joy, but most importantly, that hearts were filled with the knowledge and the thankfulness of what God has done for his people through Jesus Christ. Saints of God, we of all people have much reason to be thankful. Our God has forgiven our sins, reconciled us to himself, and filled us with his Holy Spirit all through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is good news. And so we have much to be thankful for, don't we? If you have a Bible with you this morning, please turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll be in the book of Ecclesiastes this morning, and, and our key word will be purpose. Ecclesiastes and purpose. You might be thinking, thinking to yourself that that's a strange pairing, Ecclesiastes and purpose. And if you're familiar with the book, with the book you might think that purposelessness is a better spouse. Chapter 1. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. The world, this world we live in, is full of repetition and monotony. Where is purpose? Chapter 3, for what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same, as one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. Life is short, and death is imminent. Where is purpose? Chapter 8, there's a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. The world is hard to understand. Where is purpose? But I maintain that Ecclesiastes does, in fact, have much to teach us about purpose. This morning we'll be focusing on what Ecclesiastes has to teach us about purpose despite the shortness of this life. I think it's important that we pay attention to the words of the preacher as he teaches. And I think it's also important that we understand how Christ, our Savior, gives us purpose. Life is short, death is imminent, but we have purpose because of the person and work of Jesus. Let me say that again. Life is short, death is imminent, 
but we have purpose because of the person and work of Jesus. A few questions and then I'll pray. Will you, this morning, take up the difficult task of considering your short life? Please hear me on this. Will you postpone thoughts about leftover turkey and cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie and look with me this morning at the sober reality of death? <coughs> Ecclesiastes 7, 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Will you come with me to the house of mourning? I believe that in the house of mourning, God has much to teach us about the purpose that we have through Christ. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you for your word, that you have inspired it. Thank you for what it has to teach us. Thank you that you want to give us hope and you want to give us purpose in you, not in this world, not in the, not in the things around us, not in, not in the fleeting aspects of the things that we can see here. God, you want to give us purpose. You want to give us hope in something that is better. And so please teach our hearts Please help me this morning as I speak. Please use this text and tear us down so that you might build us back up. Please encourage our hearts this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text this morning is close to the end. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 through 8. Please turn with me now. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. So first, an introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes. I know that for those uh, who have been here for a little while, a long introduction does not scare you. <laughs> but I'll try to keep it brief this morning, just what's necessary to help us understand our text. Context is so important. The only trouble here is that the book of Ecclesiastes could have years of context behind it. It is perhaps the most controversial book of the Jewish scriptures and the Christian Old Testament. And so we need the context, but we also need to get to our passage for today. So journey with me during this introduction. We'll move quickly. So first, five points of introduction. We're, we're gonna look at the title, the author, the audience, the structure, and the theme. First, title. The title, Ecclesiastes, and the second word in Hebrew, Koheleth, are the same. Koheleth is typically translated as preacher or teacher. So the, the version of God's word that you're looking at this morning will most likely use one of those two. The root word for both the title and that second word 
is assemble or convene. And, and so the meaning is one who assembles, one who convenes either wisdom or people. And we know this sort of person as one who teaches or one who preaches. Second, author. Who is this preacher? The orthodox view among Jewish and Christian scholars throughout the ages is that the preacher is King Solomon. In the first verse of the book, the author has, is identified as the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then later in chapter one, the preacher says of himself, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, 112. And then in 116, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. This bi biography seems to fit King Solomon, the wisest man before Jesus to walk the earth. So third, audience. And this is a question that's rarely asked. Who is assembled to hear this teaching? I think it's an important question to the book, and I think it's an important question to our understanding of the text this morning. So I want to spend a bit of time here. I think the simple answer in the original context is the people of Israel. This is part of their scripture. But the content seems strange to tie a bow and leave it there. The, comment, the commentator Robertson says, quote, nowhere does the covenant name of Yahweh appear in Ecclesiastes. Never is any particular event of Israel's redemptive history mentioned. Not one word refers to the calling of the patriarchs, the exodus, or Israel's wilderness wanderings. Many of the significant themes that are in this book point back to the beginning chapters of Genesis, a time before the creation of the nation state of Israel. Themes like the creation of mankind, man's fall into sin, the institution of worship and work, and man's return to dust at death, they're all present in the book of Ecclesiastes. So is, is the audience Israel? Yes, but I would agree with the same commentator that the broader audience is all of humanity. Seem like a big audience? Well, that's the point. Speaking of the preacher, Robertson says, quote, as the divinely des designated convener of the whole of humanity, as the apex of wisdom source, Koheleth, the preacher, rises above the confines of his local kingdom and speaks from a higher position. In this role, he is not to be known primarily as Solomon, the localized king. He is Koheleth, the convener of humanity, unquote. Why does this matter? I think it matters because this book speaks of truth that is true for all of humanity. This life is true for all of those who dwell under the sun. And so regardless of what you believe this morning, this book tells part of your story. You can relate to it. And not only does this book tell part of your story, but it tells parts of the stories of your neighbors and your coworkers, your family and your friends. Ecclesiastes is true for you and for every other person because it describes the common experiences of all of humanity. Fourth, structure. There's three main sections, the prologue, chapter one, verses one through 11, the body, chapter one, verse 12, through chapter 12, verse seven, and the epilogue chapter 12, verses 8 through 14. Most agree on these three sections, but the agreement tends to end there. The perceived structure of the book greatly affects its interpretation. I won't go into more detail than, than this, but I do want to make it clear today that I'm teaching from the perspective that Ecclesiastes is, that, that Ecclesiastes is a unified book. What I mean is that the book doesn't have contradictions. The prologue and the body and the epilogue are all unified in their message. Fifth, theme. I see the central theme of this book to be the word vanity. The word is used 36 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1, 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And then at the end, chapter 12, verse 8, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. It's an important theme. 
common translations of this word might be vanity or meaningless or futility. And I'll say right away that I don't, I don't love the translation of, uh, of, of this word as meaningless. And I'll explain why in a little bit. In, in Hebrew, this word is hevel. The footnote in the ESV translation says of this word, quote, the Hebrew term hevel, translated vanity or vain, refers concretely to a mist, vapor, or mere breath, and metaphorically to something that is fleeting or elusive, with different nuances depending on the context. So concretely picture a mist, or a vapor, or a breath. It's here one moment, and then it's gone the next. Over the course of the book, this, this word can be understood in three main ways. Frustration, transience, and perplexion. So first, frustration captures the cyclic nature and the inherent difficulties of life under the sun. All streams flow to the sea, but the sea is never full, and the streams never stop. This is frustrating. The poor are oppressed, and justice and righteousness are violated. No one person can fix it. This is frustrating. But I think it's important to note that frustrating is not the same as meaningless. I don't think translating Hebel as meaningless is helpful. Life under the sun is frustrating because of sin, but it's still not meaningless. God does not create something that is meaningless. And moreover, God does not save something that is meaningless, and he does not save his people unto meaninglessness. Second, transience captures the fleeting and breath-like aspects of life under the sun. The first usage of the word for vanity, Hebel, occurs in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother, Abel. So the name Abel means, van, uh, means breath or vapor. This is our word for vanity. Genesis 4.8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. And so along with a brief crisis of identity this week because of the name Abel, <laughs> uh, I also learned that it has much to teach us about the meaning of the word vanity. A few observations from Genesis 4. Abel was the younger brother who died before his older brother. He died unjustly. He died before his time. He's alive for eight total verses in the Bible. So his story is short, but I would argue that it's not meaningless. He's mentioned four times in the New Testament, including being listed among the ranks of saints in Hebrews 11, among those who had great faith. And so his, his story and his life are not meaningless. But like Abel's life, our lives here are transient. Here one moment and gone the next. The youth among us, myself included, we tend to forget the shortness of life, but the older among us know this well. This transient life with Christ, however, is not meaningless. Jesus Christ gives life meaning. Third, perplexion. This translation uh, or this understanding of the word vanity captures the confusing and mystical parts of life under the sun the parts that don't always make sense to us. So the problem of evil, for example, the righteous man perishing in his righteousness and the evil man prolonging his life in his wickedness, this is perplexing. But perplexing, again, is not meaningless. Just because the world is hard to understand doesn't mean it's not worth understanding. And so I, I hope it's clear to everyone this morning that our understanding of this word, vanity, hevel, is, is critical to our understanding of the book as a whole. If life is meaningless, purposeless, totally useless, why live? Why care about God or neighbor? Why work or enjoy or love if life is meaningless? 
God made this world and sent his son into this world to redeem it. And so may we be very slow to claim that something that God made and saved through Christ is meaningless. Okay, that's, that's all for the introduction. Let's dig into our text this morning. So our, our outline this morning, three R's, remember, return, and recreate. I'll say it again, remember, return, and recreate. First, remember. So a bit more context for our, for our passage this morning. Our passage is the second instruction to the young man, the youth in the audience. Ecclesiastes 11, 9 and 10, gives the first instruction to the young man, which is to rejoice in youth. And then Ecclesiastes 12, 1, gives the second instruction to the young man. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Notice the reference to the creator, and thus the reference to the beginning of Genesis. There's nothing in this exhortation that is unique to the Jewish people. There's no mention of the creator being Yahweh. There's no mention of a covenant, no mention of Israel here. This is a global exhortation, a global message. And so to every single person who ever lived, as you age, remember God. But what is the aging process? What does it look like? Well, the preacher tells us in verses two through six, using poetic descriptions to help us better understand. These verses are one extended metaphor of old age. Look with me in verse two. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. This verse begins the decline. Some understand this verse to describe the decline of the mind, the will, even the imagination. Others understand it to describe the decline of the body. But either way, this decline has begun. Verse 3, In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through windows are dimmed. The body is symbolized by a house, by a building. The keepers of this house, the arms and the hands, they tremble. The strong men of this house, the legs, the knees, are bent. The grinders of this house, the teeth, they cease to grind because they are too few. And the window lookers of this house, the eyes, are dimmed. Verse 4, and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. The doors on the street are most likely symbolic for the organs of communication, the mouth for speaking and the ears for hearing. These doors are shut. Thus it follows that the sound of the grinding, the voice that comes out through toothless gums, is low and soft. One rises up from restless sleep at the smallest sound, even the sound of a bird. And the daughters of song, the vocal cords, the tongue, the lips, they're brought low. Verse 5, they are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. The description continues quite literally at first. They're afraid of what is high, They're afraid of heights. (laughs) And terrors are in the way, meaning that the traffic in the streets causes great fear. And then we switch back to metaphor. The almond tree blossoms. The white flower of the Palestinian almond tree looks like the white hair of old age. The grasshopper drags itself along. The grasshopper appears to be an old person struggling to walk. And desire whether for food or for sex, fails. Why the decline? Because man is going to his eternal home. This is indeed a picture that deserves great mourning. Verse 6, Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Unlike the preceding verses, 
which talk about the slow decline of old age. This verse is fast and sudden. I think the most likely interpretation is that each of these objects represents a critical organ of the human body. So before the spinal cord is snapped, sorry, before the silver cord is snapped, meaning the spinal cord running from the brain to the, to the lower back is snapped. Before the golden bowl is broken, the bowl of the head or the skull, before the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, before the heart, the pitcher of blood is shattered and stops working. Before the wheel is broken at the cistern, the organs of digestion that nourish the rest of the body break and cease to work. Our first point was remember. And our second point is return. And pick up in verse 7. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So have you felt this build as the preacher has been describing old age? The slow decline of the body in the aging process turns to the fast failure of the body's most critical organs at death, and then this tearing happens. The return of the body in dust to the earth and the return of the spirit to God who gave it tell of this tearing of the human. And so before I continue, a question. What defines a human? What defines a human? Well, a secular anthrop anthropologist might define a human as a member of the species Homo sapiens, one who has a highly developed brain, the capacity for speech and language, perhaps the ability to use tools and to create art. Those things are true, but God would start in a different place in his definition. And so a biblical anthropologist would define a human in two primary ways from the beginning of Genesis. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Both male and female are in the image of God. And Genesis 2.7, then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Man is a combination of dust and breath. He's made from dust, the stuff of the earth, and breath, the stuff of heaven. Therefore, he has this material part and this immaterial part. We call the material part a body and the immaterial part a spirit. And so all living creatures possess what God calls the breath of life, but only humans are made in the image of God, and so have a spirit that is unique. This spirit will live on into eternity. And so back to the text for this morning, verse 7, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. The preacher tells of this undoing, this reversal of the creation of man. When God created man, he took dust and breath and put them together and at death, that is undone. The preacher is fleshing out God's curse on mankind after the fall. Genesis 3.19, God says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so when Adam sinned, he doomed humanity all of us, to this tearing apart that happens at death. And I want to make a quick note here that the returning of the Spirit to God is not inherently good. Um, it's, it's not some sort of silver lining that, well, at least we know the Spirit goes up and the body goes down. It's, it, I, don't, I don't think the preacher means it that way. I don't think he means that the spirits of all people go to heaven. And I don't think he means that the spirits of all people cease to exist like the animals. The preacher is neither a universalist nor a nihilist. The last verse of the book, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So this holy God will judge good and evil, and eternities will be decided. 
the preacher leaves his audience with no assurance of a favorable judgment, just that after death there will be a judgment. And so, so far, here's, here's our summary, and it looks rather bleak. A person's short life is filled with trouble. At the end of this life, the person's torn apart, body from spirit, and then this person is judged. Ecclesiastes 12.8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And so I, I want to take a step back and tell a personal story. As, as Brian mentioned at, at the beginning, I was recently married, and it was a wonderful time full of celebration and joy, uh, time with family and friends. But it was around that time where I couldn't get this passage, the one that we're studying, out of my head. This thought of slow decline, sudden death, tearing, and judgment. Slow decline, sudden death, tearing, and judgment. This supposed to be most happy time of life, I was, I was struggling, and I, I didn't know why. This, this text was haunting me. And looking back, in, in my heart, I was, I was crying out, if it all ends like this, why does anything matter? And so I felt the distress of verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Do you feel that with me? Just, just a little bit. I think with some time having passed, a more accurate question to what I was feeling then is, if I'm going to die one day, what is my purpose now? Has anyone felt like this? Not, I'm, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but I know I'm not the only one because questions of purpose are so common and so uh, ubiquitous to the, hum, to the human experience. But it was in, it was in this struggle, this questioning of purpose. Why am I here? It was in this honest despair that the Lord met me in such a sweet way. He taught me so much about my purpose from this seemingly depressing section of scripture. You think, what is here to teach us about purpose? What is here to give us purpose? Uh, but, but stay with me as we move on to our third point, recreate. We've looked at remember and return, and now we'll look at recreate. This point is meant to give us hope, meant to point us to our Savior, Jesus Christ. This point, however, is a little bit different in that it doesn't fall out of the text, at least not, not fully. And so my, my goal is not to take Christ and squeeze him into a text where he's not. On the other hand, my goal is to show how this text leaves us with such great anticipation. We should leave asking the question, where is my purpose? We should leave with anticipation that God would do something, that he would step into this and fix it, that he would help our fallen race, that he would do something so that our return to dust and final judgment are not the final acts for humankind. And the good news is that God has done something through Jesus Christ. And that something gives God's people great purpose and great hope. And so I, I hope you can see that, that the text we've studied is meant to crush any hope that we have here. After the preacher goes through chapters 1 through 11 and crushes everything else in this world, he lands in chapter 12 and he crushes the body because he's saying that's not where our hope is. Don't you see that this text is meant to lift our gaze to a better hope, a better purpose than this body right now? And so here's what God did. We'll take it back. God the Father grieved that his perfect creation, all the way back to the beginning, that his perfect creation had been stained by sin. He cursed those who had destroyed it. The curse was death, this separation of the body and the spirit, and judgment leading to hell. But in that curse was a promise of redemption, that the enemy of humankind, the serpent and sin and death, would be dealt a deadly blow. All of history waited on God. 
ultimately waiting on God's Messiah, the one to defeat death. So out of love, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, came to this earth, fully God, and he became fully man. He was born as a man with a body and a spirit. In his humanity, he was perfect, but he was killed. The one who came to destroy death died. And death for Jesus meant two things. One, the separation of the body and the spirit. He died the same way all people die. But two, bearing the wrath of God in judgment towards sin. The just anger that God had toward the sin of of all of humanity, that was poured out on Jesus. The sinless one was found guilty in the courtroom of heaven because of the sins of mankind. Jesus was buried. He actually died. But on the third day, he rose again. One author put it wonderfully when he said that Jesus entered death and kicked down death's gates from the inside. You see, Jesus entered death to destroy death. Jesus endured the anger, the wrath of God as a sacrifice, as a substitute. And his perfection and his deity demanded that death could not hold him. When Jesus rose again from the dead, he had a new and perfected body. And so now forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, being filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what is offered to people in Jesus' name because he rose. The requirement is faith in Jesus and repentance of sins, and the cost is free. And not only does God offer forgiveness of sins and relationship with himself, he promises that because Jesus rose from the dead bodily, those who believe in him will also bodily rise from the dead. Jesus rose and those who believe will rise too. This tearing that happens at death is undone for believers in Jesus. They're put back together. God recreates his people to enjoy heaven with him. God will recreate. Turn with me to Romans 8. Such a beautiful passage. Romans 8, verses 20 and 21. For the creation was was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The creation was subjected to futility. And this word futility carries the same meaning as the word vanity, hevel. And so many commentators believe that Paul, in this passage, is referencing Ecclesiastes. The creation, including the people, is subjected to vanity, hoping, hoping in God to be set free from its bondage. Skip a few and pick up with me in verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. So in this world, subjected to, subjected to vanity, to futility, we groan and we wait for the redemption of our bodies and the perfection of our spirits. So we've gone to the house of mourning this morning, and I hope that we're now in the house of joy, this house of feasting. I don't get as excited as I should for truth that is so beautiful, but we have an amazing God. So as I close, I want to end with some application. First, if there's anyone here who does not believe in Jesus. A word of application. Like all people, your body will grow old. And like all people, you will die, your body and spirit being torn apart. And like all people, you will be judged. This, this should not be a happy thought. The, the, the preacher's aim is to make it clear that this life here and this body now are transient. They're passing. But 
if you are not a believer this morning, also know that you will rise again in eternity. In Acts 24, 15, Paul says, there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And Jesus, in John 5, 28 and 29, says, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his, meaning the Son of God's, voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. The good to resurrection of life and the evil to a resurrection of judgment. The Bible teaches that all people will rise either to heaven or to hell, both of which have physical and spiritual aspects to them. In heaven, there will be physical and spiritual pleasure, joy. And in hell, there will be physical and spiritual torment. And so my application to you, if you don't believe in Jesus this morning, really a plea is that you would believe in the Christ who died for you and who rose again for you. Sin has to be punished. It's either punished on the person for all of eternity or it's punished in Christ and it's taken care of. And so trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Trust in Christ for purpose in this life and for hope in the life to come. Second, a word of application for uh, those here who are believers in Jesus Christ. The hope of rising again with Christ gives you great purpose in this life. A few New Testament passages, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. These bodies, broken, sinful, destined for dust, will be transformed into a glorious body like that of Jesus Christ. Christ has power to subject all things to himself. Even death will be subjected to Christ. And so, believer in Jesus, you have purpose because you are a citizen of heaven. You have hope because you will receive a better body, not like the one you're living in now. And so, the application point is to wait well. Wait well as a citizen of heaven, not hoping in what's here, not hoping in this body, but hoping in what is to come. I, I think it's so special that Advent is, is almost here, of a, a season that helps us and teaches us to wait well. And so wait well as a citizen of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 to 55. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The perishable body will put on the imperishable, and the immortal body, the, sorry, and the mortal body, the immortal. Death is defeated, it can no longer sting. And so believer in Jesus, you have purpose because you will live forever in glory. The the application point is to live with hope. Live right now. Live in light of the resurrection and future glory. This looks like thankfulness and joy. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 5 verses 1 and 2. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. So like we've been saying, our homes, these bodies will be destroyed. And that's okay because we have a home in heaven. But that's not yet. And so we wait and we groan. Later in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 20. 
Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are made new creations right now in Christ by the Holy Spirit. But our newness will only be perfected at death. But as we live in this in-between time, we have great purpose. Believer in Jesus, you have purpose as a minister of reconciliation. You have purpose in telling people that God, through Christ, is reconciling the world to himself. Ecclesiastes, as we talked about, has a global message. It's for all people. And so does the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is for all people. And so you, Christian, have purpose in warning people of the vanity of life, helping them to see that our hope is not here, that our hope is in heaven, helping them to see that the body will grow old, that it will die, that body and spirit will be torn apart, and that judgment will come. You have purpose in sharing this message about a Savior who is so much better. It, it may not be obvious, or it, or it might be, uh, but a lot of people are struggling with big questions of purpose and eternity. God has given his people this special task of proclaiming that Christ, crucified, buried, risen, gives people purpose. And though this is a special task, I know it's difficult. I, I know it is for me. But may our prayer be that God would give us great faith in Christ, great conviction in the resurrection from the dead, and great love to share with people what Christ has done. As we close, uh, please turn with me to Revelation 21. This passage holds a special place in my heart, and whenever I read it, my, my heart is, is made happy in thinking about what God will do. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the springs of the water of life without payment." Let's end with this, this chorus ringing in our ears. Behold, I am making all things new, says the one who is seated on the throne. This world, our bodies, our spirits, all made new by Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such a great hope and thank you for such purpose in the midst of this vain, this fleeting, this confusing world. Thank you that you've given your people great purpose because of what Christ has done. Father, I thank you for sending your son as the perfect 
sacrifice, the perfect substitute to wear our flesh, to be sinless on our behalf, to die, to rise. God, thank you that we can now know you because of what Christ has done. Thank you that we will one day rise because Christ rose. Thank you that we have great hope and great purpose in this life. Father, please fill us with joy now and as we leave. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.